Well, I thought I would share this fact with you today. I was born again in 1984. Anyone else remember the exact year you were born again? Or how you would know, some of us? Or like how you know you're born again? Like for me, I know it was 1984 because that was the year my whole life changed. Like everything I thought I knew just slipped away and I heard things and I saw things for the first time. You see, prior to 1984, I was stuck in the past. My dad uh, collected vinyls, 45s, right? And, and mostly his records were from the 50s and the 60s. And, and he and my mom, they both listened to classical music quite a lot. Actually, my mom almost exclusively listened to classical music. And so consequently, my idea of contemporary music, like the hot music scene in Mike's world back then, was 50s and 60s pop and 1500s classical music. Like, I wasn't exactly the hippest kid in the class. Like, I was in fourth grade, and I knew who put the bump in the bump a bump a bump <laughs> And, and I, may, I may not have known who wrote the Book of Love, but I can still, to this day, tell you all four chapters in order. You can test me on that after church. I was nine years old, in my room, crying about how hard it is to be a lonely teenager in love. I, was, I didn't know much. I was fourth grade. I didn't know much about biology. I didn't know much history. I didn't know what a slide rule is. I didn't even know what a slide rule was. But I knew what would make this world wonderful. And my brother and I, this is no joke, my brother and I used to run around in the house in our younger days in, 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 our, in our tidy whities like complete bozos. We were dancing to Bizet's Carmen. That's a French opera. We were eight, dancing and running like lunatics. I had a favorite Gershwin tune, and it wasn't Rhapsody in Blue. It's called Walking the Dog. I don't know if anyone knows that. You might know it as Promenade. It's a good one. I had a favorite planet, Jupiter, and not because of science, but because of Gustav Holst, and that was my favorite song. Like, so I was weird, but there were inklings and, and rumblings before 1984. Like, I remember one year when my brother got a white glove, just one, didn't know why, and it had glitter all over it. I knew there was something happening in the world. And then when my friend got MTV, it was like, what? There's this guy with the glove and he's walking on the ground and it's lighting up? Like, who is this? And now he's in a, he's in a dance fight and he's wearing a red, a red jacket and next thing I know, he's a werewolf? Like, what is happening with music? This is not what I grew up listening to. And my brain is desperately trying to make sense of it. And my mom, you know, she's a piano and a, and a flute teacher. She played in symphonies, right? My dad played drums in a, in a band back in the 50s and 60s, and he never left the 50s and 60s. It's like me in the 90s, only I wasn't in a band, just never left. So when my older brother, right, one day, I, clear as day, I remember, he started playing this on our piano. like, what? And Diamond Dave screams and the guitar kicks in. This did not sound like anything my mom ever taught me to play on the piano. And when my brother got a synthesizer and he joined a band, they were called Student Body. They totally rocked the seventh grade talent show. And they played Van Halen live in my attic. It was all over. My mind was blown the world just expanded. I was born again. Musically speaking, I was born again. I remember 1984. I, it was in, and we lived in Indiana, but it was in Topeka, Kansas. I, I saw Prince and the Revolution in Purple Rain 
That was like the most grown-up movie I'd ever seen in a movie theater with my family. And then I went home. No joke, I had Liz bring it because I forgot it first service. I got, this was my first vinyl. I got Prince in the Purple Rain, Prince in the Revel. Like I had, and, and I'd never, it, it was like Bizet, Carmen, straight to Prince. That'll mess with your head, right? And, 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 and so my whole world just, Exactly, Charlie, exactly. And also, because this was happening around 84, I'm going to say something that might not be popular with some people in the community here today. Some of you might not have no idea what I'm talking about. But because of when this happened, I was firmly in the Van Hagar camp, if you know your Van Halen lore. Um, granted, my first introduction was Diamond Dave with Jump in 1984, but my first album was 5150, and then I bought OU812, which I thought was the best sentence for a title of an album ever, and it had my favorite song by then, When It's Love. I'm a sucker for power ballads, especially with guys with long hair singing them. It's even better. Anybody remember that song, When It's Love? How do I know when it's love? I can't tell you, but it lasts forever, right? How does it feel when it's love? It's just something you feel together. There we go, right? <laughs> right? Actually, let's try this. It, it feels like the call to worship, so I'm going to do the first and you, you respond, all right? How do I know when it's love? How does it feel when it's love? beautiful. I mean, if you believe Sammy Hagar, and I did with all my heart, the only way to know if you're truly in love is to truly be in love. It means it's indescribable love. What, how do you know? I don't know. You just know like you know a good melon. It's probably why I get love wrong so often, because I don't know melons or love well. But I think you could ask the same question about being born again. How do I know when I've been born again? Because I think we get it wrong a lot of times. Right? Anybody thought, I've seen the light, and then it's all darkness the very next day because you slipped again. I think you could, you could do this. Like, like, how do I know I'm born again? It really does. How does it feel when I'm born again? <laughs> nice, right? Yes, right. Being born again can feel downright or be downright indescribable like love. You just know, right? But thankfully, John Wesley, like our original Methodist guy, he, he took a stab at trying to describe, like, how do you know when you're born again in a sermon he wrote called The Marks of the New Birth. Like, what are the marks of someone having been born again? And the scripture that he preached on, it's actually what we talked about last week when we talked about being born again. And that's, the scripture is from Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus from John chapter 3. You might remember that Jesus told Nicodemus that if he wanted to see the kingdom of God, he needed to be born again, right? Because, you know, people give birth to people, and, and the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. So we need to be born again of the Spirit if we want to see and experience spiritual things as greatly as we can. Nicodemus, though, he wanted, like, how can this be? How can this be? And Jesus says, look, you're the teacher. Like, you're the leader of the Jewish people. You're a leader in our faith. What do you mean you don't know how to see spiritual things? That's where we left off last week. And so we're going to pick up this week with John chapter 3, I'm actually going to start with verse 11. I want to start where we didn't hang out last week. So this is 11. This is right after Jesus says, don't you understand these things? You're a teacher. What I'm telling you, Jesus says, is true. We speak, me and the disciples, we speak about what we know. We are witnesses about what we have seen. But still, you people, you leaders, you don't accept what we say. I have spoken to you about earthly things and you do not believe. So how will you believe if I speak about heavenly things? 
No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven. He is the son of man. Moses lifted up the snake in the desert. In the same way, the son of man must also be lifted up. Then everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. And then there's this relatively unknown verse that he says to Nicodemus. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Anyone who believes in him will not die, but will have eternal life. God did not send his son into the world to judge the world. He sent his son to save the world through him. Anyone who believes in him is not judged, but anyone who dares not believe is judged already. They have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Here is the judgment. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light. They loved darkness because what they did was evil. Anyone who does evil deeds hates the light. They will not come into the light. They are afraid that what they do will be seen. Anyone ever been there? But anyone who lives by the truth comes into the light. They live by the truth with God's help. They come into the light so that it will be easy to see their good deeds. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Gracious God, we do thank you. We praise you that you are the light, that you use our children to bring that light into our midst, that we might see you more clearly, that we might be seen by you more clearly. Help us to trust you. Help us to know you. Speak into our hearts that we might grow closer to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So I got to imagine if you're Nicodemus and you hear Jesus talking about the light and the darkness and you're looking outside the window and he's like, well, I came here at what? Night. (laughs) I came here in the darkness. And I sometimes wonder, though, if, if Nicodemus, like, hadn't heard what Jesus had been doing, like, had heard of Jesus, about Jesus changing water into wine, if he had heard of the signs and wonders that Jesus had performed in, Mer- in, in Jerusalem, that, that he maybe even saw Jesus walking on water, and every time he took a set, one of the fish would light up underneath his feet, like, no, that didn't, that didn't happen. But, but I, he heard what Jesus was doing. And he knew, he tells Jesus, right, you are sent from God, but his mind can't make sense of what he's learning about Jesus. His mind is blown, the world is expanding exponentially, and here he's desperately trying to make sense of what's happening. And Jesus, at least as far as Nicodemus is concerned, Jesus isn't making sense, right? You can't go back, no, that doesn't work. You can only be born once, because Nicodemus, though, as far as, as Jesus is concerned, is stuck in the past, right? Like here's Jesus sitting right next to him singing a new song. Like he's trying to put a new song in Nicodemus' mouth. But all Nicodemus knows are the songs of the past. All Nicodemus knows are the songs that his parents listened to and sung and their parents and their parents before them. And then along comes this guy making sounds he never thought were possible. Like, you can do that on a piano? Jesus can deny the only How is this possible? You can be born again? How do I know when I'm born again? Jesus, how do I know when I'm born again? Am I the only one who's ever wondered this? Like, I want to be born again. Like, I want to believe that I have been born again. But sometimes I struggle to make sense of it. Like, make sense of the world, to make sense of religion, to make sense of myself, to make sense of my own religion, my own faith. Like, I'm all, don't, I'm all over the place. She gave me an amen in the first service. That was an unfair amen when I said I'm all over the place sometimes. <laughs> How do I know, though, when I'm born again? Luckily, Jesus actually tells Nicodemus how and how to know that. And John Wesley, in his sermon, The Marks of the New Birth, he gives us a, a, a helpful way to hear Jesus. You remember Jesus said, what I am about to tell you is true, right? No one can enter God's kingdom unless they are born with water and the what? Holy Spirit. 
We must be born of the Spirit. And Wesley read this, and he remembered Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. It's a famous part, verse 13. Like if you've ever been to a wedding, you've probably heard it. And he talks about how we're all given gifts by the Holy Spirit, like all of us, every one of us, spiritual gifts, every one of you. And all of our gifts are different, Paul says. All of our gifts are important. All of our gifts are equal. Almost all. Because Paul says there are three gifts of the Spirit that are more important than any of the others. Like the gifts that will outlast all the others. When your gift of singing and your gift of prophecy and your gift of speaking and your gift of running really fast away from me. The, that's my kids got that gift. When those gifts all fail, there are three gifts that will remain for all of us. as faith, hope, and love. These gifts to help us know that we've been born again. The three most important things to have, Paul writes, are faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of them, Tommy, is what? Love. love. The greatest is love. And so Wesley says, how do I know when I'm born again? Well, when you start maturing in faith, when your hope comes of age, and when you get to the fourth chapter in the book of love, then you'll know you've been born again. You can hear it in Jesus' words to Nicodemus. Jesus says to Nicodemus, what I'm about to tell you is true. We speak about what we know. We're witnesses to what we have seen, but still you people don't accept what we say. I've spoken to you about earthly things and you don't believe. So how will you believe if I speak about heavenly things? Like, we're logical people, right? We're rational human beings. We have this drive to understand things, to take them apart, see how they work. Anyone ever been one of those kids or you had a sibling that takes the toasters apart just to see? And typically they're better at taking it apart than they are at putting it back together. But even people, like, like human beings, we like to take animals apart to figure out how they work. We take people apart to figure out how they work. We're, we pretty much dug up. We've taken the whole earth apart trying to figure out and understand the earth. And now we're working on the moon and on Mars. If we can't understand it, if we can't dissect it, it might as well not exist. If we can't explain it, it doesn't matter. I need to see it to believe it. But Jesus tells us, like, that's not getting us anywhere. Plus, if we are struggling to believe the things on earth that we can't explain but have seen, if we struggle to have faith in the things right in front of our face, how can we have faith in the mystery of God? The things of God that remain unseen but felt. We can't. We can't. Not now. Not while instead of the kingdom of God, we're living in the kingdom of the show me state. We need to be born again into a faith that believes where we have not seen. A faith that doesn't just say, I believe in God intellectually. Like, I believe in the idea of God. I believe in all the things they told me in Sunday. Yeah, I believe that, whatever the teacher said. I believe. No. Are we willing to put our whole trust in his son and the sacrifice and the resurrection that we never saw but we know it's true. So how do we know we've been born again? When not just the intellectual assent to the tenets of our faith, but our trust in what Christ has done begins to grow. When that trust in what Christ has done starts to calm our fears and puts aside our urge to respond to those fears in sin. Because usually when I respond without thinking to my fears, it's the wrong thing. <laughs> to put our trust in the one who we cannot see but we can know. That is faith. And then Jesus continued, no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven. He is the son of man. Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, and in the same way, the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him, Jesus says, hope. So often, when life is difficult, it is our hope 
that things will get better that sustain us, right? Like my friend is in the hospital and doesn't look good. I hope she gets better. I don't know if she's going to get better, but I sure hope she gets better. I didn't, this is one throughout my life. I didn't study for the test, but I hope I do well anyway. <laughs> Like, I don't, I don't know if I got the answers right. I mean, I didn't study. How could I know if I got them right? But I hope the random pattern that I made on my Scantron matches up the pattern that the test creator made when they made the test. You think we're going to make it? I don't know. We left pretty late, but I hope we make it. You see, earthly hope is a... A guessing game. It's, it's wishful thinking. It's like playing the lottery, which is probably the most frequent place in the English language when you hear the word hope, right? I hope I win the lottery someday. I hope these are the right numbers. But biblical hope is much deeper. Spiritual hope isn't a game of chance. Christian hope is founded on a truth. The truth that Jesus lays out right here, that he is the one who came down from heaven and is going back to heaven. And that in his death and resurrection, Christ raised us with him back into eternal salvation. And that one day we're going to be raised alongside him. When we're born again, our hope for the future matures from wishful thinking into a certainty. Hope isn't a wish. It's a certainty for us that the world and each of us will be made whole once again because of Christ's sacrifice, that at the end of the day, all will be well, and all will be well, and all will be well. It's the certain hope that says, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. The song doesn't say, because he might live. Because I think I know, because I know, because he does live, I have a hope that will carry me through to that day when I know that I live again, too. And finally, how do we know that we're born again? When we begin to truly mature in faith and in hope and in what? Love. And the greatest of these is love. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that anyone who believes in him will not die but have eternal life. And I, we always do 316. Somebody got to tell, um, tell the athletes that do that to put dash 17 when they do that, right? Because 17 keeps going. God did not send in his son into the world to judge the world. He sent his son into the world to save the world through him. For God so loved us that he gave, and he didn't judge us, he saved us. And that, friends, is perfect love. That is the love of one who is born again. And that brings us to the real question. If the pinnacle of being born again is to experience and to give perfect love, then how do we know when it's love? How do we know when it's love? How do we know when it's love? When it's a love that doesn't judge, but that offers salvation. And the best part of it all is that we have the perfect example of perfect love. And again, it's from Paul in 1 Corinthians 13. You might have heard some words like this before in your life, that love is patient. Love is kind. It does not want what belongs to others. It does not brag. It is not proud. It does not dishonor other people. Love does not look out for its own interests. Love doesn't easily become angry. It doesn't keep track of other people's wrongs. Love is not happy with evil, but it is full of joy when the truth is spoken. Love always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. And it never gives up. Love never fails. Love never fails. So so how do we know? How do we know when we're born again? We know when our love does the same as his love. 
Because y'all know, right? You know who wrote the book of love, right? I mean, the song doesn't know, but we know it was Jesus. He wrote the book of love with his life, death, and resurrection. Those are the first three chapters of the book of love. And the fourth chapter comes when you do the same in response. When our love mirrors the love of the one who showed us what it means to love, that's when we are truly and fully born again into the life we're called to live. Amen? Amen.